mass for us. We can hear it and by your grace apply it to our lives. We pray for the message today that you would help us in this regard. Uh, we know that when it comes to the topic of, of marriage that there is much joy in a congregation when the topic is brought up. Uh, but we also know that, uh, that there are many of us that have been uh, affected by marriage maybe in a negative way. And the whole topic uh, brings up pain and it brings up hurt and it brings up heartache. Uh, so no matter our standing before you in these matters today, O oh Lord, we pray that by your spirit uh, you would come and minister grace uh, to each and every heart that is here today. And we pray that we might see the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ very, very clear. For we pray in his name and for his sake. Amen. Hear now God's word beginning to read in Matthew 19 and verse 1. Now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, Not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this receive it. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we've seen in these studies this fall that Jesus never dodges the tough issues or the tough questions. He addresses the realities of life head on. He speaks as one having authority. He doesn't mince words. And we see this again today in his teaching on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. As you see in our passage, the topic was a relevant topic in the first century and I don't think we need the reminder that it is a relevant topic in the day in which we live in the 21st century in America. American culture has largely rejected the Bible's teaching regarded, regarding human sexuality. It began in the 1960s with the sexual revolution, and this revolution has created many, many problems. It has contributed to a high divorce rate, and this has wreaked havoc on marriage and the family. Not only this, now over 50% of Americans approve homosexual marriage. Over 50%, the majority, approve uh, marriage outside the instruction of Scripture. The term transgender is commonly used as if it is normal or it makes sense. Folks, there is no such thing as transgender. Trans means your gender changes. Your gender is fixed in your DNA. If your sex chromosomes at conception are XX, you are eternally female. And if your sex chromosomes at conception are XY, you are eternally male. End of story. Gender confusion is a psychological disorder. It is not normal, yet our crazed American culture is seeking to normalize it. And need I even mention the sexual harassment scandals currently rocking Hollywood 
and Washington. Folks, we are in a mess in this regard in our culture. And yet Christ in his truth comes crashing in on us this morning with his word of instruction to us about human sexuality and about marriage. He cares little about cultural beliefs and practices. He is prophet, priest, and king, and he cares deeply about us. He cares deeply about our culture, and he cares deeply about speaking his healing truth into this issue of marriage. Well, we're going to look at this today in Matthew 19 in, in great detail. I want to walk through the passage. Uh, here we have Christ's encounter with Pharisees over this issue of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And we'll see the encounter in a number of back and forth exchanges that Christ has with the Pharisees. Now, the first exchange is found in verses 3 through 6. And notice under this exchange, it is started by the Pharisees coming up to Christ in verse 3 and asking this question, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? That last phrase is the key thing to see. That is, can one divorce his wife for trivial matters? Now notice the context of this question. There is a context behind the question that the Pharisees pose, and the context is religious debate. And the Pharisees were seeking to get Christ caught in the middle of two schools within Phariseeism that taught concerning marriage. Now, there were two schools in Phariseeism in the first century. One was the school of Hillel, and the school of Shammai. Now, the Hillel school was the more liberal of the two parties, and they allowed divorce for trivial reasons, for any reason that one of the spouses would want to bring up. The Shammai school restricted divorce. Sexual unchastity was the only ground. So that is the context of the question. It comes from religious debate in that day. But notice the nature of the question again in verse 3. They tested him by asking, do you think these men were genuinely interested in truth here or something else? Well, they were interested in something else. Uh, if you'll note in verses 1 through 2, we read that Jesus is on his way uh, to Jerusalem. He's entering the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. He's going to the center of religious power and position in that day, the religious center of Judaism. And he was a threat to them. Uh, they're primarily seeking to undermine him, to trip him up with a thorny religious question. They're not really that interested in marriage. They are very interested in undermining the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they seek to draw him in to this religious debate in that day. So that's the nature of the question. They're not primarily interested in truth. They are seeking to test the Lord Jesus Christ. And then notice the essence of the question. The essence of the question is they were looking for justification for an unlawful divorce. Uh, the Pharisees were using scripture to support a sinful practice. Later on in the passage, you'll see that they quote from, or at least it is mentioned, a quote from Deuteronomy 24. And they are taking this obscure passage in the Old Testament law in Deuteronomy 24 to undermine the very clear passage in Genesis 1 and 2 that, that Ann read a few moments ago. So they were twisting the Word of God to justify evil behavior. That is the nature of this first exchange in the Pharisees' first question. But notice Christ's response to them in verses 4 through 6. Notice, first of all, the manner of his response, the manner of his response. Notice what he says, have you not read your Bible? That's the gist of it. 
We probably ought to pause there. Have you read your Bible about the issues of marriage? Have I read my Bible about the issues of marriage? Am I basing my beliefs in this regard on the clear teaching of Scripture? That's always a good spot to begin. Uh, few read their Bibles closely and carefully in the first century. Few people in our day read their Bibles closely and carefully about issues. Jesus begins the response begins his exchange with them with just a simple question, have you read the scriptures? Notice secondly, Christ's mastery in his response. His mastery in the, his response. The Pharisees quoted scripture in verse 7, but Christ demonstrates a mastery of the Word of God in his answer. Now there's something that's going on here that's very, very important. There is a principle in Protestant interpretation about the Bible that's called the analogy of faith. In other words, when we encounter an obscure passage, we allow the clearer passage in the Word of God to guide us toward the obscure. We do not let the obscure undermine what is already clear in Scripture. There's many things in Scripture that are hard to understand. It's a book that's written a very long time ago, uh, different cultural practices in the day in which the scripture was written. So it only stands to the reason that there's gonna be some sections of the word of God that are difficult to work through, but there are some sections that are just crystal clear. And we do not allow the obscure to undermine that which is clear. Now, you say, why do we as Protestants practice that? Because Jesus practiced that, and you see him doing it here in this passage. He doesn't allow the obscure passage in Deuteronomy 4 to undermine the very clear passage that we read earlier in Genesis chapter 1 about the foundations of marriage in God's design. So Christ's mastery of Scripture, it is striking here in this passage, how he can go to the experts in that day, the ones that should have been able to handle the word of God, and yet the master teacher of the Lord Jesus Christ shows them how the scripture should be handled. And then finally, notice the message in his response about marriage. You see very clearly in this passage the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is simply affirming what is found in Genesis 1 and throughout the Old Testament in regards to God's design in marriage. Notice, first of all, Christ brings a message of separation. A message of separation, verse 5. A man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. Notice, secondly, he brings a message of union. Hold fast to his wife. And he goes on with this imagery that they will be one flesh. There will be this intimate union between male and female, a message of separation from parents, a message of union with each other, and then he brings a message of permanence. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Do you see the force and the power of what Christ is doing in this passage? He is returning them to, and he's returning us to creation before sin entered into the world. When God is doing some very foundational things in regards to revelation, he is going to God's original design, God's original intent for marriage. And divorce was not an option. It was not envisioned. A new family is created. Leave parents, cling to each other. An intimate, inseparable union is established. Hold fast, be one flesh. And then permanent stability and foreverness dominates. And you say, why is this? Well, for one thing, it's the teaching of the Word of God, and we should just stop right there and accept it. But marriage also serves as a portrait on earth of God's relationship with his covenant people. Does God establish an 
intimate union with us through the Lord Jesus Christ? Of course he does. We talked about this in Sunday school this morning, that Christ reveals the Father to us. Saving faith knows the Lord Jesus Christ. Saving faith enters into this relationship of seeing God as our Heavenly Father. That is an intimate union. And once that union is established in regeneration, it is never, ever severed or broken. And that is why Christ is teaching here. This institution on earth that represents my relationship to my people, it is one of permanence. What God has joined together, let not man separate. So that's exchange number one. Christ corrects their mishandling of the word of God and he settles the matter by pointing them and us back to God's original design for marriage. But there's a second exchange that you see in our passage. The Pharisees respond with another question. You see this in verse 7. Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce? And they quote a passage from the Mosaic Law that allowed for divorce in certain cases. And again, as I said earlier, they are countering Christ. They are rejecting his clear teaching in verses 4 through 6. And they are using in their minds scripture to justify their sinful practice. Well, notice once again how Christ responds to the Pharisees. You see this in verses 8 through 9. First of all, he gives a clarifying response in verse 8. He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. He clarifies the reason for Deuteronomy 24. Human sin or hardness of heart was the reason behind Deuteronomy 24. The divorce provision was given to protect the innocent party. It was not given to open up the door for easy divorce over trivial reasons. So he gives a clarifying response in verse 8. He gives a reinforcing response in verse 8. But from the beginning it was not so. See what Jesus is doing here? He's saying the ideal of Genesis 1 that we read earlier it still applies. It is still in force. Like he said in verses 4 through 6, have you not read the Bible and seen what God teaches on this from the very beginning? And then finally, Christ's response is a direct response, and you see this in verse 9. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Uh, Christ states clearly the only grounds for divorce, and the grounds are not trivial, they are not for any cause, the only ground for a biblical divorce is sexual immorality on the part of one of the parties. So clear there in verse 9. Now unfortunately at this point things do get a little complicated as these cases can become sometimes and as this teaching on marriage can become. And part of the reason for the complication and the complexity here is the word that Christ uses for sexual immorality. It is a broad term. Uh, it would definitely include adultery, but it can also include other sexual sins. In other words, Christ seems to be broadening the door here in regards to the sorts of sexual sins that would be grounds for divorce. Uh, so that kind of complicates the discussion here through this issue of divorce and remarriage. He uses a broad term here and not just uh, adultery. Uh, secondly, divorce is not mandated and reconciliation is always desirable. The passage is not requiring divorce in every circumstance. Ending a marriage is a serious step. 
In fact, the one flesh emphasis in the passage strongly encourages reconciliation. God can heal, God can restore, and God can repair broken relationships. And there's a third thing here. It's not necessarily in the passage, but most of us know uh, that great emotional turmoil can attend these matters, and this can contribute to uh, the complicated nature of these discussions. Things can get tense and in some cases even volatile, and this can make these discussions uh, very, very sensitive when it comes to divorce and uh, remarriage. Now, Matthew 19 is one of those passages that it takes about 20 to 30 minutes to preach uh, but it takes a, a lifetime to apply. There's no way in one sermon that I can sit here and cover every situation, everything that happens in individual marriages sometimes that leads to divorce, and I'm not even going to try. But I do want to make several closing comments in this regard regarding the teaching of Christ that we see in this passage. I'm going to have five points of very quick application here. And the first of all is this to young people. Uh, young people, pray fervently and think Christianly about a future spouse. Outside of your decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, the decision regarding whom you will marry is life's most important decision. And if you're a young person here or if you're a young person that may hear the sermon on YouTube, I want to encourage you to pray fervently about this issue of marriage, to think Christianly about a future spouse and ask God to prepare that individual even now for your future relationship with them and marry only in the Lord. Very clear teaching in 2 Corinthians 6 that we are not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. So young people, pray fervently and think Christianly about a future spouse. Secondly, if you're in a troubled marriage, seek help. Uh, that is what pastors and elders are for. Uh, you may say, well, I'm, in too, I'm too embarrassed by the situation, and I just have to say, humble yourself, follow our Lord's teaching in our passage, and do everything within your power to save your marriage. If you're in a troubled marriage, seek help. Uh, the teaching of the passage is towards permanence. The strong words there, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Do everything within your power, depending upon God's strength to get the help that you need if your marriage is troubled. Third, the Christian church must uphold the teaching of our Lord in this passage. Session, it is our job in this local assembly to teach, uphold, and apply the standard of Christ so clearly stated in this passage. So that's three points of application. There's an interesting fourth point of application, and it has to do with verses 10 through 11. Notice what the disciples said to Christ after the teaching. If such is the case of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. Isn't that an interesting response on the part of the disciples? It kind of gives an indication that they understood what he was saying in regards to the permanence of the marital bond. And the disciples are saying here, if the standard is this high, maybe the best thing to do is not to even get married. So they make this comment about celibacy. And Christ surprisingly holds that out as an option. He mentions eunuchs, which were the king's attendants of that day, who were celibate. And he says there's three ways that people become eunuchs. They are eunuchs by birth. They are eunuchs by vocation. Surgically, they are made eunuchs. And then he mentions some who are celibate or eunuchs by decision, eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. I believe that Christ is teaching here 
if you're not going to follow God's design in marriage, it's best not to get married, and to con get married, and it's better to consider a life of celibacy. And personally, I think that he is commending celibacy for some and insinuating that it is noble and good and that God provides special blessing and special strength to those who choose this option for life. Singleness can be a great blessing with God's strength and with God's help. And then the final point of application that I want to say here this morning comes from Psalm 130 and verse 4. And the passage just simply says, with the Lord there is forgiveness. In other words, our God is a forgiving God. And if we have had to go through a divorce for whatever reason, whether it was a biblically grounded divorce or one that did not have biblical grounds, no matter the reason for the divorce, God can restore and he can renew and he can bring reconciliation. And if you have been touched by divorce in some way, there's hope for you and there's hope for me in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to close this, uh, this sermon or this lesson with a quote by a commentator that I read on this passage that is very, very good. His name is Matthew Green, and he has this to say as he wraps up his commentary on this section uh, of Matthew's gospel. Difficult though this is, we must remember two things. It is not possible for the ethics of the kingdom of God to be articulated in anything less than ideal terms. And yet the Lord is consistently compassionate to those who fail, repent, and come back to him for restoration. This passage follows hard on the heels of one that expresses the unbounded mercy and forgiveness of God. By the way, I taught on that passage a couple of Wednesday nights ago, the, the, the parable of the unmerciful servant. If you're interested in hearing that sermon, you can access it on YouTube. A great parable that teaches the, the boundless nature of God's forgiveness. So legalistic rigorism is as inappropriate for the Christian community as is casual divorce. Clearly, Jesus taught that God's will for humankind is the indissolubility of marriage and the equal partnership within that marriage bond. For Christians, his teaching is normative. Nevertheless, the whole thrust of his teaching is against legalism. What is more, he is replying to a hostile question and operates within the constraints of that context, and he is giving an ideal, not laying down the law. For these three reasons, it is not possible to give a compelling answer to whether Jesus would allow remarriage uh, after divorce in some circumstances, adultery and maybe others such as insanity. What is manifest is that he is in principle against divorce and remarriage, and he would be appalled at the ease and frequency with which it takes place today. One of the most powerful Christian witnesses possible these days is the eloquent example of a warm, forgiving, hospitable, united, and happy Christian home. Let us pray. Our Father, we come to you in, in light of the